Welcome to the GCN Tech Clinic. Just me here this week. And the Tech Clinic is where we aim to answer your bike and tech and, well, cycling related questions. And you can submit your questions using the hashtag AskGCNTech down in the comments section below. We do our best to get through as many of them as possible each week. So without further ado, this week's first question comes from Julian Pritzwald Stegman who says, this is one for Ollie. How many watts do aerobladed spokes save over round spokes? Bonus question, J-Bend or straight pull? What's more aero? Well, it's very difficult to put an actual number on it without testing it, and not many brands have actually tested this. And the way you test it is through testing rotational drag. It's not something that you can test in a standard sort of wind tunnel format. You need to build a jig that can measure the deceleration of the wheel when you spin it up um, to a set known speed. And then the once you account for the bearing friction that slows it down, uh, what's left is the rotational drag within the wheel. But there are other sources of this. One of the sources is the spokes themselves. Now, undoubtedly, aero spokes are slightly more aero than round spokes, but it's not a huge amount and it varies from spoke to spoke. So it's hard to you know, give an exact number on it, but you're probably talking within the region of around a watt. So not a huge amount, but it's one of the reasons why Mavic no longer uses those big, huge carbon spokes that were like the size of pencils, um, despite being very bling and nice and light and stiff, they weren't very aero. Um, so there you go. Also, I, I do know that when DT Swiss were designing their latest uh, wheels, they put internal nipples uh, to reduce rotational drag and they calculated that this saved 45 kilometers an hour, around 0.8 of a watt. So marginal, but every little helps. Next question is from El Ciervo, who says, he's got a late eighties road bike with Shimano BioPace chain rings on it. And he's having a hard time coming to grips with the wealth of opinions about what BioPace is supposed to do and what mounting position he should opt on his BioPace chain rings. Can you clear up whether BioPace is functionally or a failure or whether it works as intended? Um, right, well, for those of you who aren't familiar, Shimano BioPace are non-round chain rings that were brought out by Shimano in, I think they actually brought them out in the 90s rather than the 80s. Um, but the idea was, what you now see with non-round chain rings. Uh, for some people, they feel that they can make their pedaling uh, more efficient by taking advantage of the different muscle groups in your legs and how you can sort of eliminate or reduce the dead spot in your pedaling by putting more, but you have a bigger effective gear on the downstroke when you're able to use your quads, which are the biggest muscles uh, you have. Now, the Shimano Bioplate, Biopace is no longer in production uh, by Shimano and it was pretty short lived and I think that tells you everything you need to know. Um, it was regarded as sort of a, a failure. Um, they tried something new, it didn't quite work. And the reason why Shimano Biopace was considered wrong is because um, while certain brands now make non round chain rings, the orientation of where the non round part is and the hardest part is the opposite to where BioPace set it up. So it's widely regarded that non-round rings can help some riders, but not in the orientation they were set up when Shimano devised BioPace. So there you go. It is something of a collector's item though, so if you, uh, if you don't want to use it, then um, you can always get it on eBay. Or um, if you find that when you pedal with it and it's fine and you like it, keep it. It's fine, it's very individual. Uh, next question is from DS Ordo has a question about disc brakes. He says, why the hell, anytime I take my wheel off for some bike maintenance um, and nothing to do with my brakes, when I put the, di the disc brakes back in, the disc is automatically rubbing on the pads. I can't wait for uh, a rim brake bike again. Well, right, so there's a number of reasons that this can be happening and you might not be doing any of these things, but the two most common things I would say is, when you take the wheel out, be careful not to depress the brake lever in any way as it will close the pads slightly. And that will mean that when the, the wheel, either the, the disc won't fit in between the pads and you won't be able to get it bit back in, or if it's just closed a fraction, then that will cause it to rub 
The simple solution is to just prise the pads apart again when the wheel's not in, in position. Um, but just avoid doing it. And then the other thing that can happen is when you are putting your wheels back in, if you're not properly aligning them in the dropout or you're not properly tightening uh, the through axle or quick release to the appropriate uh, torque, that can cause a bit of play or a slight bit of misalignment as well. You might not be doing either of those things, but they're the two most common things. But without seeing your bike, it's very difficult to see what is actually going wrong. Uh, but I hope you fix it. And next question is from Jamie Farrell, who says, Hi team, what bags or boxes do you folks use when you take your bikes on flights? Well, uh, we, we fly quite a lot and travel quite a lot with, with bikes and bags. And it's something I've been doing for many, many years. And I've pretty much used pretty much everything that there is out on the market right now. And I personally prefer to use a hard case because I think it just offers better protection. And the one I'm using at the moment is called a Topeak Pack Go. It's a hard case. And the other thing I would suggest you look for is one that has really good wheels and is easy to push around an airport because some of them are much harder to pull or push around airports than others and it really is tiring and a real pain. So the Topeak one's really good for that. So I really like that. And it's just, it's a, it's a really good box. It's probably actually my favorite one I've ever used, to be honest, it's very good. Um, next question is from Moderate Wrist. And he says, what is the most aero way to carry stuff on a commute? Panniers, backpack, touring style seat post bag, or maybe even a, a bag over the front of the hoods. Well, um, it's not something I've tested personally, but if I were to wager, I would imagine the best place would be on the back of your seat post on a bike packing style uh, seat post big bag. And this is because that's typically where the wake of the rider is. So if you're chucking, um, a bag there, that's a pretty aero place to put it. This, there's, there's precedent for this in terms of bottle placement on bikes. That's actually the kind of best place to put bottles on a bike is behind the saddle. And that's why we see tr top triathletes, um, Ironman athletes, they, it's where they put their bottles behind the saddle. So that would be a good place. Backpack could also be good, especially if it was like a special aero backpack, almost like a kind of fairing backpack that could work. But it's going to be largely system dependent and vary from rider to rider and your position. But I would say probably go with this. I would go with the seat post bag. There you go. Um, next question is from Tom Van Bruggen, who says in big races, you always see riders chucking their bottles at the start of a climb to save weight and go faster. But how much difference would it make if you ride up a climb with no bottles in comparison to two full, two full water bottles? Thanks in advance. Well, I have uh, mapped this out on my favorite climb, Sacalobra in Mallorca, where our GCN Mallorca event is about to take place. And that's a 10 kilometer long climb, at an average of about 7%. Now, at the speed that I try to ride up it, uh, if you were to lose two 500 mil water bottles, which in total weigh a fraction over a kilo, um, a kilo weight difference is fairly significant or not significant, depending on your point of view. But I've calculated it to be worth around 18 to 20 seconds over the course of a 10 kilometer climb. So over on a short climb, it's not really worth much at all. Um, and to put that into context, five watts is worth more than that 18 seconds. So to give you, you know, an idea, weight isn't everything, power counts for more. So there you go. But if you did want to save 19 seconds, chuck your water bottles, uh, or maybe just empty them out. Chucking them is bad for the environment and you might lose them. Well, unfortunately, that's all I've got time for this week because I've got to head out to Mallorca for our GCM Mallorca event. So if I've not managed to get through to your question this week, then please keep them coming down in the comments section. Persevere, and myself or Alex or Manon will do our best to answer your question in a future tech clinic. Give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it and I'll see you later. Bye.